Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's APM webinar, Is the Modern Day Project Manager Soft Enough? I'm delighted that Nigel has joined us uh, to share his knowledge and also get you involved in tonight's presentation. My name's Robert Allen. I'm APM Branches Manager, and I wish you all a happy and healthy 2021. You'll find yourselves on mute mode tonight, but that's not to say we don't want your involvement. As I said, Nigel will be using Menti, so in the chat function and also shown on screen later will be the uh, URL and the unique code to get involved. We also welcome your questions along the way, and this can be done in your main control panel. So please submit those and time dependent at the end, Nigel will happily answer these. I would personally like to say thank you to all the volunteers across the APM branches and the APM SIG for all their efforts and achievements, both last year and this year, with putting these webinars together. So, Nigel. Nigel has an extensive background in IT project management, predominantly in automotive and aerospace sectors, along with a mix of retail, fashion and healthcare experience. I'm really pleased that Nigel can join us again tonight, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. So, Nigel, over to you. Thank you, Rob, and welcome everyone this evening and a very belated Happy New Year. Uh, before we start, Rob has already mentioned that we're going to be using Menti this evening. Uh, if you've got your phone open or you've got your iPad or you've got a spare browser on your PC, if you head over to menti.com and add in the code 1878634, you'll be able to take part in the interactive elements of what we've got going on this evening. Now, that's twofold really because A, it gets you engaged and entertained and involved in the session this evening but secondly and equally importantly the slideware that's produced from this webinar will contain all of your input in a really neatly packaged pdf so you'll get that after the session and as a, again if you can head over to menti.com 1878 63 4 then we can join in and what i would say if you are using your phone or a device that locks itself every 30 seconds or so if you want to remove the unlock because one of the interesting things we're going to have this evening is a short quiz and there will be prizes but your phone does need to be unlocked because we've got timed um, sections for the questions so that's Mentimeter so please join us on that and what I do want to do now is really just signpost you what I'm going to be covering over the next 40 to 45 minutes so first of all I'm going to start off by just explaining what is coaching? You know, sometimes people get it confused with different things like consulting or mentoring even, use it interchangeably. I'll try and give you some definitions which really will make you understand exactly what coaching is and what it can offer. I will then delve into a bit of history in terms of the life of a project manager, in particular my own. So I'm going to draw a modern day parallel of what I do today based on what I did 20 years ago to see that journey more into the agile age, but also how I think, in my experience, the profession has changed, and for the better, I have to say. Uh, I'll cover three key competencies after that of coaching, which you can apply as a project manager. And there's, there's no secrets in any of this. Everybody knows what all of these things are, but perhaps you don't use them to their fullest extent. So part of my role here this evening is just to raise your awareness. And it will be a fun quiz, as I mentioned, so uh, get your uh, phones at the ready. I'm going to extend the, the prizes to the first five places because sometimes not everybody wants to, to win the prize, but I'll tell you what the prizes are after the winners are announced. There'll also be an element at the end of this webinar for a bit of reflective practice for you to feed back to myself and everybody else on the webinar this evening in terms of you know, maybe what's the, the most important thing you've heard or the, a great reminder you've come across this evening, or well, one thing perhaps you're going to do differently as a result of being here this evening. And then time permitting at the end, and I want to leave time for this, any Q&A that comes in through the chat to Rob, who's going to marshal those questions, I'll take those at the end of the session. So thank you for, for that. And now I just want to open up Menti and just get you to show me uh, what your knowledge of coaching is, you know, have you ever been coached? Maybe you are a coach, maybe you've had it done once, maybe you get it confused perhaps with mentoring or something, but just take time now just to um, 
put onto the screen where you are with coaching and how you understand it. Got some good results coming in, so great that people have got their own coaches. That's absolutely fantastic. One of the things we won't cover tonight, but coaching is very much a goal orientated process and so our performance reviews or our personal goals, it's really important the coach can really help you achieve those. So we've got a fifth of the people on the call are coaches, so there's gonna be no surprises um, to some of the stuff I'm gonna to say tonight. But some people in there as well are talking about, well, it's the same as mentoring, isn't it? Well, there are some key distinctions which I want to illustrate as I go through the talk this evening. And of course, there's a component of people this evening that haven't really heard of it at all. So I'm hoping to cover all bases for you here this evening. But again, thanks so much for taking part in that one question. OK, I'd like to start, as I do with most of my webinars, with a, a bit of a quote. And this one is from myself. And it's just through my career as a project manager over time. And we all, we're all now in the agile age of project management. And what does that really mean? Well, for me, agile is more of a mindset than a methodology. It's the modern day way of doing things. And it is more relationally based, which is why I've come up with a strap line, soft skills for hard outcomes. And when I go through that roller coaster ride of a day of a life of a project manager 20 years ago, I didn't know all of these things as starkly as I know them today. And it's a classic case of if I knew then what I know now, but I'll be sharing that with you as we go through. Now, what I want to do at this point is just kick off the quiz. So we've got a bunch of participants here. So you should on your phone get an opportunity to type your name in, or of course you can just adopt an alias that's given to you. Either is fine. If you're in the top five at the end of the contest, at the end of this evening, just remember what your alias is and, and send Rob a quick note so that I can connect with you afterwards. So I'm just getting everyone to get ready for that. The questions are timed, about 10 seconds or so. It's a little bit like who wants to be a millionaire. So it's not just the right answer, but it's also the right answer in the shortest possible time. So good luck, everyone, and let's go. So what is it that coaching fundamentally focuses on? OK, excellent. Well, the good news for everyone is that actually all the answers are correct. So well done, everyone there. As is usual, there are some answers that are better than others. And for me personally, as, we, as I go through this uh, webinar this evening, my two key takeaways on coaching is all about taking action and also taking responsibility. But equally, everything else on there is absolutely true. So absolutely raising your awareness. We'll be doing that uh, this evening. Challenging thinking. Uh, one of the big things that stops people moving forward is fear. OK, we don't necessarily cover that tonight, but certainly challenging your, your fear and repositioning or reframing it is an important component used in coaching to get people to alter their mindsets setting goals fantastic but it's all about action you know very often we can think about doing things but it's what we actually do uh, fundamentally talked about fears generally speaking as we're born we're only born with a fear of two things one is loud noises and the other is a falling over every other fear that we have going through life, be it from school, parents, environment, work, whatever, uh, we create in our own minds and believe, but fundamentally we can break those as well. And the things that we can control, uh, thoughts and, and our actions, and that's why actions are so important. So well done. So let's just take a look at the, uh, the leaderboard right now. Well, everyone got the question right, of course, but who got it right in the fastest time? OK, so we're just going to look at this now. Here's our top 10. And it is Massey goes into, uh, I guess, a shock lead at this point in time, followed by Chelsea, Will, Bucks and Puffy. So we'll look at that leaderboard as we go through the webinar this evening, just for a little bit of fun. And uh, I think we're going to move on now to uh, our second question. Uh, second question relating again to coaching. But what is it the client does in the coaching relationship, do you think? Is it they need direction, advice? Have they got all the answers? Or do they need support for 
other things. Okay, very, very interesting. I'm going to part answer this question when I come on to a following slide, but fundamentally, coaching is all about the clients or the coachee having the answers within themselves. The needing direction is a little bit like a consultant, which I guess in a body of project managers, we are by definition consultants because we go into our customers, solutionize, recommend, and take them on a journey. The needs advice is halfway house between consulting and coaching, pretty much called mentoring. I'll also touch onto that as well. And the need for support for trauma or things that have gone bad in the past is more of a counseling or therapy intervention. But again, I'll, I'll um, talk about those in a little bit more detail on a future slide. So let's now see then how the leaderboard looks after question two. Looks like Gina got that uh, right fastest. So Laura B, Will, Neil, so Puffy's still in there and Gina's coming to the top five, so well done. Massey just dropped out a little bit, but there's still time. It's only, I think, four or five questions this evening. It's just a little bit of fun. And uh, let's see how that progresses over the next 30 minutes. Now, I talked about coaching and coaches, that the coachee has got all the answers within themselves. And the metaphor I'd like to bring to your attention at this point, if you can consider an acorn, typically roughly about that big, okay? An acorn has everything within it to become a magnificent oak tree. It doesn't need anything else. The only things it needs are three things. It just needs the soil, water, and sunlight in order to grow. And then it can just flourish into a massive oak tree. And in the same way, as individuals, as people, we have all the resources within ourselves to become whatever we need to be. And that's why giving advice or direction to a coaching client is not particularly helpful, because very often, if you tell somebody what to do, they just feel completely disempowered. They haven't thought of it themselves. They don't get that rush when something works. They don't get that learning. And if, of course, if something goes wrong, they've got someone to come back and to blame. So coaching really fundamentally is a process about drawing out rather than putting in. So around about 2013, I got really interested in coaching. And I guess it was about 13 years ago, I came across something that Google had done uh, called Project Oxygen. Now, some of you may be aware of, of this, it was a, an internal survey they did with regard to the traits and characteristics that their successful leaders within the organization sort of sort of epitomized with it within the roles that they did. And things like, you know, not micromanaging, you know, very empowering of their staff, very inclusive of team management, a, a healthy dose of, you know, psychological safety within the workplace, very results orientated great communicators that listen and share and really good on team development. Now, of course, this was a fair while ago, but we, we sort of recognize some of these things as the modern day and the modern way that projects and organizations run. So very sort of agile focused. Now, all the things I've just mentioned there, very important, but number one on the list for Google's Project Oxygen was their leaders being coaches and coaches you know, enabling, empowering individuals to work out their own solutions and giving them that right level of support. So that for me was a bit of juxtaposition between where I had come from in my previous industrial life to where this new coaching journey was taking me. And what I'd like to do now, I'd like to just go back um, to when I started my career, which was pretty last century, I have to say, I cut my teeth in the automotive industry. And if any of you on the webinar this evening have ever worked in automotive or even the supply or logistics chain, you may very well recognize that fundamentally it's a very task orientated um, environment. And I actually started life as an engineer. So very structured, very analytical, very task focused. It all felt right. And particularly in the automotive industry, from my experience, it was all about the result. It was all about getting the job done, 
which of course is very important. And if you look back on that, what I've got on the slide there for the traditional side of things, it's all about schedules, it's all about managing plans, Gantt charts. There's a bit in there about team management, communications and stakeholder engagement are in there, which are really good and are still valid today. But fundamentally, it's about meeting facilitation, reporting, documentation, those type of things. And very often, I felt myself to be a single point of failure as a project manager because it was usually the fall guy, the guy that got hit over the head if things didn't go well, irrespective of the fact the customer often didn't know what they wanted. So that was my that was my role, my remit way back when. And I have to say, moving from engineering into project management, I was a little bit like an accidental project manager. And I know that for a fact because I was almost like an ambulance chaser as well, because in the projects I ran, which is probably a testament to the way I did it, I was parking ambulances with increasing frequency through my life cycle to pick up all the casualties on the way. So very, very difficult environment. And I, I was thinking even way back then that it's more about the tasks as, as well. It's all about how you get on with people. So I'd like to do at the moment, so at this point now is to say that's a very task focused way that I used to do and operate. And I just want to talk about how that's changed for me over the last 20 years of my career. So it's interesting to note that, as I mentioned before, communications and stakeholder engagement still prevalent and it's still vitally important. But you can start to see on the right hand side of the screen, we've got things like relationship building, team development and coaching starting to come into there. And for me, one of the biggest changes is all around the team. So you'll notice on the traditional side, I've got team management, but on the agile side, I've got team leadership. And it's this old sort of debate about management and leadership. It's efficiency versus effectiveness. It's doing things right to doing the right thing. And I just feel now the focus in, in the more agile age that I'm operating, which has got a more people focused element to it, is far more, if you like, relational. And what the biggest lesson I learned, I think, over that time is that, yes, the task is vitally important. But if you don't get the people side of uh, projects right, the task side sort of goes out the window. I used to work in software project management, big ERP programs for quite large customers. And if you don't take the customer and the team on the journey, you can deliver the best solution in the world, but the level of adoption can be quite poor because people aren't invested in the process. It's all about just getting the job done rather than getting their input and getting them on board. Now, of course, a lot of this is, is pretty much common sense, I guess. And, uh, you know, it, all I would say is it's not necessarily common practice or even best practice, certainly from when I started in my career, but certainly with the onset of Agile, which I'm happy to report that one of the things that my prior experience over 20 years in the automotive industry gave me was that things like Kaizen and Kanban, which are now staple sort of principles of things of the modern day Agile, are nothing new, essentially, just been rebadged and re-engineered and packaged in a way to make it more and more helpful. Certainly when I was in the automotive industry in the 90s, things like Kaizen and Kanban were 40 years after Toyota had implemented it after the Second World War. So great principles coming through to how to manage projects more effectively. So maybe perhaps pick up in the questions at the end, but I'd like to see perhaps if anyone else has got any sort of, uh, you know, can relate to what I'm sort of suggesting here, because uh, that's certainly the journey that uh, my project career, management career to date has taken me on. And at this point, I just want to cover some coaching competencies. Now, for the coaches out there, and I think we're about a fifth on the call, there are quite a few um, key co coaching competencies. Goal setting is one that I spoke about um, earlier, talked about empowerment and generating and taking responsibility. But I just want to cover three others this evening with the time that I've got around questioning, listening and providing challenge. So before I delve into the detail, we're going to head into the third of our quiz questions. So I'll just give you a chance if you need to just unlock your phone, perhaps if uh, you know it's locked since the last time we've used it, 
and I'm just going to hit the uh, the enter button just now. Okay, so one about questioning. What's the best type of question to ask? I've been quite generous on this one. For some reason, I'll give them 15 seconds. It probably could be answered in five or less, but let's see how we get on. Okay, well, I'm happy to report that uh, the vast majority of you got that right. Clearly, it's open questions. One of the key tenants about coaching is asking questions rather than making statements. Making statements is pretty much like the old command and control style of project management. Asking questions is pretty much asking the subject matter experts who probably and should actually know far more about the particular aspect, what they're working on, either being functional or technical, as you as a PM need to do. And, and just to answer off a couple of the other things on there, Closed question, absolutely not. All you're going to generate is a yes or a no. Closes the conversation right down, as in fact does a choice question, you know, because you, you might be giving people a range of answers to give, like a multi choice, but maybe only limited for, to four. Doesn't allow that person to expand. What you really want to get um, through coaching with these big expansive questions is to get information back so you can raise people's awareness and show them things they don't necessarily know about themselves. So well done for everyone for answering that. And I just at this point want to, uh, uh, we've all heard Jungle Book and Rudyard Kipling. One of the staple things I use in my coaching practice is to an ask a bunch of these questions all around what and when and how and where and who. But I've actually italicized the why question. And I just wonder if anyone on the webinar tonight would like to hazard a guess as to why sometimes asking why is not a good question to ask, even though it can be an open question. If you've got your Menti screen open, there is an ability at the bottom of your Menti screen to actually type in a, a little comment, which will come up on the bottom right hand of the screen. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to think about that and then I'll share with you why I think that um, uh, why is not a good question to ask. And actually some people have hitting it right on the head here. Sounds judgmental. Why can be a negative re response. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. For those very same reasons, what you're trying to do with coaching is actually cultivate a very open, non-judgmental conversation. OK, so if you start asking people, well, why have you done that? And why didn't you do that? Very often you're going to close people down. Now, the one exception I would say to this is that sometimes a, a perfectly shaped why question can get right to the heart of the matter very, very quickly. But what I would say is that you do need really great rapport for that to happen. So sometimes you need to know the relationships of the people that you're having. But thank you, everyone, that um, that uh, contributed to that. Yeah, it does prevent uh, critical thinking. What you're trying to do is open up rather than shut down the other person. So. Uh, but again, use that mantra. I find it quite useful, you know, in terms of knowing what to ask about. So open questions. Yeah, so in, I, I just moved on from that screen. I just saw there sometimes saying, you know, why are you doing this? Maybe a better question to ask is what are the benefits? You know, what's important about this to you? It's less of a threat. Uh, coming across that uh, other person. Now, I did mention earlier on that um, I would start to talk about the differences between consulting, mentoring, coaching, and things like um, counselling or even therapy. Now, all of them are what I call talkative treatments or interventions, okay? Particularly when you get more to the counselling and therapy, that's got more of a, a medical nature to it in that sense. But fundamentally, as I mentioned before, as project managers, I would guarantee that 90 odd percent of everything we do is in the directional consulting field. We are the experts. We're brought into a client. We solutionize. We recommend. We take them on a journey, you know, and just to, to bring this to light in the metaphor with the picture I've got on the screen at the moment. If I was a consultant and we were sat in London, and we needed to drive to Manchester as a consultant, I would get into the driving seat. The client would be in the passenger seat. I would set the sat nav. 
and I would start the car and I would take the client to Manchester the way I felt was best. I would set the sat nav, I would choose what gears I'm going in, I'd, I'd regulate how fast I wanted to go or how often I needed to brake. But fundamentally, as a consultant, it's my responsibility to solutionize to get the client to where they want to go. Now, I mentioned that the mentor was a little bit of a halfway house between coaching and consulting. So what a mentor would do in this situation is they would sit in the passenger seat and the client would sit in the driver's seat. And fundamentally, the mentor, you can sort of consider them to be someone that's been there, seen it, done it all and got the T-shirt. And sometimes they're more senior, but not necessarily. And they're there to guide and advise rather than necessarily to actually fully direct. And in this relationship, the client comes along with their own goal or outcome that they want to achieve. And the mentor will help them do that. But on occasion, we'll say, for example, well, do you know what? I wouldn't go the M1 towards Manchester at this time of night because it gets a bit busy, you know, on a, on a Thursday afternoon. You're better off taking the M40 then hitching across onto the M42. It's probably better at this time of night. And the client might decide to do that. They might not, but it's entirely up to them. You know, it's their agenda. It's their destination that they've set for themselves. The mentor just gives a few hints and tips to help them get there. Usually a seasoned professional that uh, has done that journey many times before. Now, in contrast to that, in a coaching relationship, the coach would also sit in the passenger seat and the client would sit in the driving seat. And this time, the whole responsibility is on the client. So they will say, for example, I want to go to Manchester. And all the coach would do is just ask questions about the best way to achieve that goal. And in the picture you see on your screen, if you can see that the headlights on the car, like lighting up the way on the road, th these lights are like the questions. If you refer back to what I mentioned about the acorn and the oak tree, you know, the sunlight that enables the oak tree to grow from a small acorn. Those are the questions. That's the value a coach brings to that particular relationship. So the coach will sit back in the in the passenger seat, be non-judgmental, be a very equal relationship as well, very confidential relationship. There'll be no egos, they'll all be left at the door. Fundamentally, all the coach is interested in is making sure that the client gets a good experience from coaching and gets them, you know, along the journey and also towards their their destination. So they'll just be asking questions and if the client decides to go up the M1, you know, what are they going to learn about the fact that when they get to Watford Gap Services, for example, there's a big hold up because they haven't necessarily paid attention to the traffic report. What's the best way of navigating from there on in? And just I just want to touch on while I've still got this graphic on the screen, when we start going into the more negative side of talkative treatments like counselling and therapy, the thing to remember is coaching, mentoring and consulting are future focused in terms of outcomes. Counselling and therapy are looking back in the past pretty much to understand why you are where you are as opposed to where you want to get to. So in a similar situation, a counsellor and a client in a car would probably spend more of their time looking in the rear view mirror as to what's happened rather than what's going forward. So I hope I've explained that in a way that is relatable um, to everybody. I just want to uh, now move on and really just talk um, about listening. And every time I do this segment on listening, I'm always reminded of uh, the late, great Stephen Covey when he mentioned that most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. And that's so true from my own history. You know, I've heard about active listening for longer than I can remember. And I always thought I was a great listener. But it turns out that fundamentally, you know, I wasn't. And uh, there's some some really neat things we can do in the listening frame to make sure that we understand people much, much better. Because when we start to understand people, we can make better connection, we can make better rapport, get a better relationship and get better outcomes for ourselves, for the other person and also for the project. So just moving on from that, I think I've got a question on this, question four or five, so penultimate question coming up here. 
So uh, just give you a moment just to uh, unlock your phones here. So the question is, what's best that we can use to listen deeply? Okay. Okay, great. Again, really happy that a majority of people have got that question correct. I think first and foremost, and we'll come on to levels of listening in just a moment, but our ears fundamentally are just receptors for sound. And we can often find, I mean, I live about a mile from the M42 here in Bromsgrove, and sometimes I can hear the distant hum of the traffic on the motorway, but I tend to filter that out so I don't actually hear it at all. And really the difference between hearing and listening is taking the sounds in to elicit understanding. So for me, you know, ears are, are just a tool. It's the way that you effectively use them. Your eyes, absolutely fundamental. It's what you see. We'll come on to talk about in a moment, particularly around body language. Your body will give away more than the words you will ever say. If anyone's ever come across any statistics about communication, that your body leaks about 70%, you know, when you sort of sat like this or, or like this, or, you know, those type of mannerisms and facial expressions and the way you, you use your body can communicate far more, as I say, than the words that you say. The mind is an interesting one, and I'll come to talk about that um, when I talk about active listening. But when I talk about body on the next question there, this is all about your senses fundamentally. You know, what is it that you're noticing? You know, and we'll come on to some really key aspects which can allow you to build some really fantastic rapport just by listening with your body. So again, well done to um, everyone on that particular question. And let's just see how that uh, shapes up on the leaderboard. This is the penultimate round. So let's see who's... Uh, running the pack now so Laura B marginally in the lead from Neil with uh, Gina coming up pretty close it could be all to play for in the final question we've got Massey and Chelsea's back in there in the top five which is really good and we've got some Ogie was really fast on that one so uh, fast on the next one it could make really all the difference so we've we only show the top 10 on this but uh, Thanks for everyone else that's contributing here. And as I mentioned at the start, uh, when you get the PDF of all the interaction and input from this particular session, you'll get all this to go as well. So if the winners need to frame it, they can. So just moving on. I just want to talk about um, three levels of listening, uh, really. And, and you may be aware of some of these. Now, they are what we covered in that last quiz question. So the first level of listening is what what's known as conversational listening or as as I like to call it out to lunch listening and this really is where there's no listening actually going on at all if you ever seen yourself in a conversation with someone and then all of a sudden you think to yourself what on earth are they going on about I haven't picked up anything and that's really because there's a number of things really you've got your own internal chatter and your dialogue going on in your head it's not present for that other person you're often thinking about what you want to respond with back to the Stephen Covey quote or you're looking out for what you want to hear now very often we don't listen for um, anything other than you know what we want to hear you know in, in return and we're all just waiting in effect for that other person to stop and then for us just to launch in and I think one of the reasons why people um and er uh in conversational speaking is that they've sort of run out of things to say, but they don't want anybody to jump in on the pause. So they just go for a bit of an er, uh, then carry on again, and almost to prevent the other people sort of joining in. These are all things going on around um, conversational listening. And I'm sure, you know, you've, you've been in situations, I know I have, where I've been talking to someone and, you know, I'm looking at my watch or I'm looking at my phone, you know, and trying to think what's on TV tonight or how bad's the traffic going to be? Maybe not too bad in these current times or, you know, what's that series I'm going to watch later or I need to ring Joe or whatever. And you're not thinking about what that other person's saying. And if you have been in those situations, you will recognise that it can be really disrespectful, you know, when someone's trying to tell you something and actually you're not really paying attention at all. So I'm sort of thinking we've all been there in that sort of situation. And I 
for myself, spent many years there thinking I was good at listening when fundamentally um, I wasn't. So what I'd like to do from conversational listening is move into active listening. And I guess most people on the call, if not all of you, are fully aware of what active listening is. So we're taking it up a notch now. If uh, conversational listening was number three on the podium, then this is the silver medalist in that respect. And this really means that we are using our ears in a better capacity. We're using a present mind. And what I mean by that is we're really dialing down that internal dialogue to be truly present for that other person. So no distractions, you know, the phone's off on mute or whatever, you know, there's no clutter on your desk. You've got no notifications popping up on your screens or anything else. There's no noise or you're not going to be interrupted, you know, as you go through and you're purely there for that other person. And in this sort of situation, what you need to be aiming for is roughly a 70-30 listening to speaking ratio. So for 70% of the time, you're really silent. It's a very, very hard and difficult thing to do because as people, as humans, as individuals, we all like to talk and very often we all like to talk about ourselves. But when you're fully present for somebody else in a conversation, it delivers so much respect, you can start to get really, really good rapport. And the other component about active listening is not just the listening part, it's also the acknowledgement that you're listening to the other person and that you might do that with, with a, a nod of the head or a, a yes or whatever as they're talking to acknowledge what they're saying. But the key bit on active listening comes when they finish saying what they've said and you as the listener just replay back to them some of what they've said using the exact words they have used. Because very often, and particularly in a coaching conversation, when you've got a, a client that talks and mentions, his, mentions lots of things, when you replay that back in the same language with the same words, it has a different meaning to that person. They sometimes didn't realize they said it or meant it in that way, and it can actually lead to some quite good revelations. I would avoid, if you could, trying to put your own spin on words because it was the label the other person used to describe something. It means something different to them as it would to yourself. Sometimes paraphrasing is quite useful to give an alternative perspective, but that can border on opinion and almost judgment, which I would avoid. Best to actually use the language that, uh, that they used. And of course, in active listening, you're not doing the classic thing that we would have done in conversational listening, which is all about interrupting, which of course leads to this level of, of disrespect in the, in the particular conversation. If we were in a room right now, I might break everyone into single pairs and we would do a very, very quick exercise and you would start to understand the real benefits of proper active listening. And just as an example, you don't actually have to be in a conversation to be in the active listening zone. So for example, if you've got your favorite piece of music or even your favorite book or even your favorite film, and you find yourself totally immersed into what's going on at the almost exclusion to everything else that's going on around you, you're then in that active listening mode. So, you know, even if there was a slight distraction, it's not going to pull you off the focus of what you're doing. And certainly film and music is really good for that. And sometimes even a captivating speaker can actually get you in that zone as well, get you very, very interested. So that's active listening. And actually there is, as I've alluded to already, a, an extension now to an even deeper level of listening, which is called bizarrely deep listening or global listening, or you might see it somewhere referred to as uh, level three listening. And we take all of what we've learned from active listening, and this is where we use all of our spidey senses, if you like. So we're looking now at things like breathing, you know, is there any hesitation in their speech? What's their pitch, pace and tone like when they're talking? And very often, I know we're all in the Zoom world right now, but sometimes you can pick up um, people's breathing patterns and stuff like that and hesitations more acutely on a telephone than you can actually face to face because you've lost that visual cue, all your other senses are sort of heightened. And again, what you're looking for here are, you know, the body language, you know, so 
is their body language congruent with the words that they're saying? So a real classic example of this is, you know, someone that's saying yes, but nodding their head this way around, you know. So you're looking for that level of congruency in the words that they're saying. And again, you know, you can almost pick up in their breathing, you know, what energy levels they've got within them. Are they depleted? Are they happy? Are they sad? Again, on a phone or even without video, you can sometimes pick up when people are smiling when they're talking because of the way they project themselves. Okay, so it goes a lot, lot deeper. And all of these things demand a lot of practice. It's certainly not anything that you can sort of get overnight. And I'm still on that journey, by the way, in terms of trying to perfect all of these things. And what you're really looking for in deep or global listening is for the communications outside of the words. What is it they're not saying? Because as a coach, you could prompt a particular question. So, for example, as a coach, you know, every time I use a particular word or phrase, a particular question, you know, I might see a flinch um, on my client's face or, or a slight shrug of the shoulder, you know, and I'll take note of that. And if it happens, say, you know, in a pattern sequence of maybe three or four times, I might ask a question to say something about that that makes you behave in a certain way. Is there something that you want to open up about? And that can sometimes allow you with permission to go a little bit deeper into those conversations. And again, a little bit like active listening, as the listener, not only do you want to dial down your own distractions, but you want to increase that listening ratio probably up to 80 or 90 percent and be totally present for that, for that other person. And if you do that, you will really connect with them at a deep level because, as I mentioned before, people like to talk and pretty much talk about themselves. And when when people are truly listened to, it can make all the difference. So I would recommend that you try it out. As I say, if we're in a room, we'd have a go at doing that uh, now, but uh, maybe that's one for later this year if we're allowed to uh, get back in person. And just a couple of tips before we leave listening. There's, there's two techniques that um, I just want to share with you about how to become a better listener. Now, the first one is to mentally repeat the words as they are spoken in your mind. And that's a pretty difficult one to do, but you can start to internalize it uh, when you do that. And as you do that, it also stops or prevents you from talking as well, which is all well and good. The second technique is a little bit more Heath Robinson and it involves putting the, uh, or rather putting your tongue onto the roof of your mouth as you're listening. And I think the only reason for that is so that you actually physically stop yourself from talking, but it's a good technique to do to stop yourself, you know, from from wanting to jump into a conversation or finish somebody else's sentence off, which again is incredibly annoying and can be disrespectful. So if you start to notice these things in yourself or other people, you're now a little bit more aware of some of the techniques that uh, you can use. So I hope we found that segment useful. I just want to move on from listening now to well, sorry, I just want to finish off that segment on listening. And I coined a phrase about talk less, no more. OK, and that really encompasses this big ratio of listening as opposed to talking. And if you do that, you will generally learn more about the situation. You know, it's all about asking questions to get the right answers. And there's always a lot more questions that you can ask to get to the nub of a particular situation. So the third thing I just wanted to move on from a coaching perspective was about raising awareness. Now, one thing a great coach will do through listening and questioning, they will use listening techniques to work out what questions to ask, then listen again into a really virtuous circle. So they've got this really good rapport going on with you. And through the feedback through listening, what a great coach will really do is bring out things in a client that perhaps never recognized in themselves. And the way I like to see this is seeing things in plain sight. So again, for those of you that have read The Seven Habits from Stephen Covey, you may have come across a diagram in his book where he's got the picture of an old lady and a young lady almost transposed onto a single image. And depending on which way you look at it, you can see it two different ways. And what I've got on the screen here is just a different adaptation of that in that what a great coach will do is show the client things which are in plain sight. Okay, so again here, if you want to 
type in on, on the comments on Menti it'll come up on the bottom right of the screen. There's something in this picture which is standing in plain sight. And my idea here is that once you see it, it's very, very difficult to unsee. Okay, so it sounds as though many of you are seeing this right now. So yeah, there's that white arrow between the E and the X. Now, if you looked at that logo and couldn't see it, and now you can see it, um, I guess my question to you is, is it difficult to unsee? And I'd hope the answer is going to be a little bit like a yes, because the same concept in the metaphor of coaching, that when you're more aware of what's going on for you, it's very, very hard to unsee certain things. But I'd like to take this a step further as well, because there's also something else in this FedEx logo that's in plain sight, just staring back out at us. And I just wonder if anyone knows or can see anything else in this particular logo. So I'll just give you a moment or two to think about that. Anything pop out to anybody at all? Perhaps if you just focus on the purple side of the logo in the FED area. Okay, yeah, someone's got, it's a little bit of an abstract picture, but if you look at the E, you could say there's a bit of a, a medical spoon or something in there, a little bit abstract or no, but again, it's something that does stand out. And very often, if you look at the logos of, um, you know, very uh, high profile organizations, you'll start to see little pictures and, and hidden things within them. So the next time you look at a Starbucks uh, logo, look at the face and look at the symmetry of the face because totally symmetrical faces are not attractive. And just look what the, uh, they've done with the Starbucks logo. Look for the uh, hidden, the hidden uh, animal in the Toblerone logo if you come across that. And there's also a very interesting one with the McDonald's logo. And so many, many of the uh, most famous brands around the world start, start to use this type of imagery to sort of help reinforce their message. But that was just a, a by the way in that sense. And just moving on. So we've all got mobile phones. They're all very smart. Here's mine. It actually updated itself today or actually updated itself with the click of a button and whether you've got an iPhone or an Android you know they, these things go from version 1.1 to 1.2 to version 2 to version 3 you know pretty much in half an hour click of a button and why is all this important well fundamentally for people it's not that simple when we spoke earlier about what's you know what's one of the great things about coaching or what's a great one of the great responsibilities it's about taking action the only person that's going to get you from version one to version two is yourself and I guess the question I've got for you here is you know where's the button that you press which does your updates your iOS 12 point whatever it is version you know and that better version of yourself because fundamentally without any action you're not going to move any further forward. Yes, coaching is all about goal setting, but it's also the steps that you take to achieve those goals, which is vitally important. And I just now wanted to cover off in terms of providing challenge. So again, I'm assuming the diagram I've got on the screen is fairly familiar to most people right now. So, you know, we all have a sort of low risk comfort zone where things are in arm's reach and it's very easy to satisfy and, and get things at the moment. It's, it's very predictable, you know, maybe it's quite rewarding because of the situation you find yourself and it's very safe, it's very comfortable, but it's not particularly stimulating. Now, what a great coach will do is they'll take you from that position and get you into the growth and learning zone, okay? But to get to the growth and learning zone, you've got to go across no man's land, which is the biggest barrier to most people. Now, I spoke about fears earlier on and, you know, born with just those two fears of loud noises and falling. And that's it. Everything else that we've got as a fear in terms of, you know, we're not good enough or we're too old or we haven't got the skills or we don't have the time or the resources. These are things we just construct for ourselves. So we need to get over those. What a good coach will do is expand your comfort zone, reduce your fear zone, and make that learning zone really, really important to you and keep you in that zone because that's where you start to set goals, work out your own motivation. And by the way, motivation and happiness is an inside job. 
nobody else can do it for you so it's something you need to draw out from yourself in that respect but when you do get into learning and growth zones you start to learn new skills you start to set goals and you start to achieve things and again just to give you a personal example um, one of the things Rob didn't mention at the start is actually I come from the dark side so I'm actually a board member at the Project Management Institute UK chapter okay and about a year ago I was doing uh, in-house um, uh, not webinars but live events um, around around Birmingham and universities and, and corporate headquarters on this sort of subject to to rooms of people now of course come March 23rd last year when we all went zoom crazy and we're all zoomed out by the end of April online digital way was the last thing I ever wanted to do because I just had a fear that I couldn't do it but I just embraced it and thought the only way to to learn it is to absolutely do it so what I've done over the last almost one year now because it's been our world is just try to master the environment overcome that fear that I'm not good enough that people won't want to listen to what I've got to say or you know they won't find it interesting those type of things I've got to move above and beyond that and just try and in my mind do the best I can deliver that quality and take it from there and the feedback's been fairly good and that sort of takes you further and further forward and personally what it's done for me I've got my lists of fears my lists of excuses I've started to tick them off now because they're no longer valid. I can't say that I'm not now competent at doing this. I've got a fear of failure because I've proven it to myself too many times with a pattern to say that it shouldn't no longer be there. So again, that's just a personal example of how I expand these zones. But one thing to be mindful of is that if you get too overwhelmed in coaching and particularly with goal setting where very often you set massive big goals which actually I would recommend it's the breaking them down bit that's really important you, the sense of overwhelm can lead you to panic panic can lead you back to fear and again a really great coach will keep you within those boundaries so that you don't go outside of your natural limits but just something to bear in mind of if you're keen to understand coaching and goal setting you've really got to start setting goals which are outside your comfort zone because you want the motivation to go and achieve them and to reach them and you won't do that necessarily in the comfort zone all you will do is do the easy things as opposed to the right things so just moving on and i think we've got the final question coming up now so i'll just give you a moment again to uh, unlock your phones and um, this is the final question coming up this evening i think it's one about active listening so let's see uh, how you get on with this one so what year did i say google's project oxygen was okay well again really great so there's a lot of people on this uh, webinar tonight that are listening out so fundamentally, I didn't I didn't say what the year was, but I sort of alluded to it because I said 13 years ago, which you could work backwards and extrapolate to 2008. So well done to uh, everyone that's got that. But again, just another example of listening for what's being said in the words. And I deliberately picked something from very early on in the webinar. So thank you everyone for paying attention to that. That's really good. And now it's a time to, uh, to take a look at the final results and see who the winners are. So let's see who got the question right first. Okay, so Magical Rhino, is that going to come up? So we've got Laura B. Excellent. Well done, Laura. We've also got Gina, Massey, OG and Will. Um, if those are your real names, fine. If they're your aliases, then please could you send... Uh, a note to Rob in private chat. The prize, by the way, is uh, I've talked a lot about coaching and some of the competencies and skills. What I'd really like to offer to the first five contestants in that quiz that, that top the list is to give you a, a deep dive of a coaching experience to immerse you into the world of coaching, to work on a goal that you want to achieve in the future, and then work out how you can achieve that and maybe start to address some of the things that may be stopping you or again to take the FedEx, you know, raise awareness of things you weren't, um, uh, you know, you weren't aware of yourself and those type of things and to push 
stretch and challenge you. So uh, the offer is for a, a free one to one and a half hour coaching session. So you get immersed into the world of what a coaching experience looks like. So thank you everyone that took part in that and congratulations, Laura, on that. Just coming to the end, I do want to leave time for a few questions, but I mentioned at the start of the webinar that fundamentally I believe that uh, you know, the modern day, day agile PM, you know, is already a coach that does use soft skills for hard outcomes. And you know, perhaps one of the messages I'd, I'd like to leave you with today, certainly from my own personal journey, is that I feel that project management is more relational, it's more about communication than the hard things that project management delivers. I think, yes, the task is very important, but if you get the people elements right first off, actually the task bit would, would follow. Trying to do it the other way around, certainly my experience didn't work particularly well, so I sort of learned the uh, the hard way. I may be teaching some of you to suck eggs, but I've just gone the uh, the long way around for some of these things, but that's just the uh, the lessons that I've learned. And, and at this point, I just want to take a moment or two to just do a little bit of reflective practice. You know, so I just encourage you again on Menti to maybe input onto the screen here, maybe a great reminder that, that you know this particular webinar has prompted you on, or what you felt the most important thing that you have heard during this webinar, or maybe you know, what, what's most important that you've you've thought during the course of this webinar, or maybe something that you're going to stop doing or something that you're going to start doing, or maybe something you're just going to do differently. And again, like I mentioned at the start of the webinar, all this great input that you're putting into Menti right now will be captured in the PDF that uh, I know Rob will circulate at the end of this session. So uh, thanks for all the inputs. Please come, keep them coming in. I'll leave it open for another minute or two. But again, yeah, that internal button to upgrade yourself, really vitally important. And, and just... You know, when you think about that button, just think about action. It's something that you're going to have to do because fundamentally nobody's going to do it for you. So it's all about what you do for yourself. And my one piece of advice about wanting to achieve your goals is to do one thing every day that gets you that little bit closer. Yeah. And the key thing from a big, massive goal, you know, just break it down into something that's manageable and tangible. that You can see the light at the end of the tunnel, because very often if it's too overwhelming, that just creates inertia. There's a lot of good stuff coming through on listening. I'm glad that segment of the webinar resonated. Yeah, great, take responsibility. Procrastination, that is a webinar in its own right. Stay in the learning growth cycle, completely understand that, yeah. Improve listening skills, a lot of stuff coming through on that. Thank you so much everyone for your participation this evening. I think there is just one final question coming up and that's just a bit of a, a a view of how well this evening's webinar was put together for you how well was i prepared what did you think about the registration process and what the apm do in the background to put these events on if you could just take a moment to uh, just give us a little bit of feedback that would be really appreciated and that's looking pretty good so far <laughs> Yeah, I'm good that, um, that it's scoring quite high in terms of what you can readily adapt to your particular situation. I mean, the, the purpose of these webinars is not just to uh, educate or entertain, but it's to give you some practical things that you could take back into your work or even your personal life. So thank you for the, uh, for the input, Sarah. That really does give us a good quality check in terms of the, uh, you know, the standard of the stuff that the, the APM is doing and the people that they're working with. So that's really, really great. Just want to move on to, I think, the final slide I've got. If anybody wants to contact me, by the way, um, just outside of this webinar, just for a general question, clearly take the top five winners, of course. But there's my contact details there if you need to reach out to me and my LinkedIn details as well. So in a nutshell, I'm a project management coach, so I'll understand the world that you guys are all living in and we've got this question side i've just seen rob pop back up on the screen what the one thing i do have after the questions rob i do have the future events slides for apm so uh, time it as you need to and i'll just hand the floor back to yourself thank you everyone excellent, excellent. thank you nigel and uh, on behalf of the apm and and everyone that's joined thank you very much for sharing uh, congratulations to everyone who participated in the quiz um, I must admit, I was joining in the background and my name never got into the top 10, so I'm a little bit jealous, but I'm going to 
I'm going to put that to one side and move on to the questions. Um, so Neil has asked, what do you think about self-coaching? Can it be as effective? Uh, that, that's a tough one. I mean, part of the reason I, I, I trained to be a coach was because I wanted to find myself or save myself, you know, from these soft interpersonal skills. I think it does come back to the fears because I have all the same fears as everybody else. And there are certain questions I won't ask myself or I won't even answer myself. So even though I'm a coach, I've got my own coach that keeps me honest and keeps me accountable. You know, so it's a, it's a virtuous circle. But fundamentally, I think you can self coach yourself to an extent. And it's all about mindset. So we talk about being responsible and taking action. I think that's well within everybody's control but i think there does come a point particularly with the big stuff that you want to challenge where i think you do need a coach or a mentor yourself and i certainly do that and i think anyone that um, talks to another great coach will they'll also have their own coaches as well and they'll also have coaching supervision so it's a bit like professional development in a way in the way that you know the apm you know you get your certification or, or your qualification you keep it going you keep on trend and all those type of things because you can get stale so i think personally you can probably go 70% of the way you're going yourself, but if you want to get that extra mile, which may be the difference that makes a difference, I would recommend getting a coach for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. I, I saw one just pop up on your um, mentee. I, I'm sorry, I don't know who posted the question, but they, they asked, is there any um, online free resources that people could go and look and explore this topic a little bit further? Obviously, I know you're also happy for people to make contact with you, but is there like a go-to place that you go to? The trouble is it's all over the place. And the one thing I would say about coaching, Rob, is it's some um, completely unregulated industry. Okay, so there's no APM or PMI equivalent for um, coaching. There is a, something called the ICF, which I think is going a long way towards, you know, making it a credible profession. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's hundreds of books. I think one of the things I can probably do for you, Rob, after this event is come up with a bit of a reading list or a recommended list. And what I would suggest is just go onto YouTube and look at some of the book reviews rather than going out and buying these, because very often, you know, these books are quite expensive to buy and you, you're only going to get nuggets from all of them. But certainly The Seven Habits, which is 30 years old, is a good one. Coaching for Performance by Sir John Whitmore, excuse me, is a staple diet of most modern coaches but i can provide some some if you like a bibliography list of things that can be can be used but there's such a, a plethora of them out there rob it's really difficult to to nail them down into classic texts really Excellent. i mean some of the no. best ones i mean think and grow rich by napoleon hill written in 1935 i think it's 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 a staple diet of modern coaching today and if you go back in coaching in history i think you can go back all the way to the greek age and stuff like that Excellent. You're, you're a star like that. I, I know you jokingly said about you being from the dark side and the PMI, but you, you really are good. And um, if you could provide us with some resources, and as you said, yeah. we'll, we'll happily send everyone that's joined us um, a copy of the mentee results. And yeah. if Nigel's happy to, to supplement that with some additional resources, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. Nigel's also allowed us to record today's session, and that'll be on the APM YouTube. Um, so feel free to to come back and look at this again, share it with your friends, etc., who who might benefit from it. Um, I know one extra question popped up, and it popped up and disappeared so quickly, but I think it was linked to um, languages. Um, I, I I didn't catch it completely, so apologies. I don't know, Nigel, if you're able to read it off Menti, but I didn't. I, I saw it on the screen, but one thing I'm really conscious of, one of the things I've really learned through visual presenting is looking to the camera because it's a great way of making connection and rapport with the audience. I saw it on the outskirts of my eye and because it was like six lines, I thought, oh, I can't read that because I'm losing track of what I'm talking about. So whoever put that in, if they want to post it in again, I'm, I'm more than um, happy to, uh, to see if I can answer it for you. Perfect. Let's give that a couple of seconds. Okay. I must admit, apart from that, it's just been great comments. So. Uh, Okay. Rock has said, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Neil, Neil has responded saying thank you uh, for answering his previous question. Um, and to hear uh, you have a coach is great. Um, Ashuk has uh, put his name next to the, the books and the reference question. And he says, thank you for that. And he looks forward to the, the information. Um, but no, it doesn't look like the, the language questions coming back. But what? What we'll do is we will um, 
endeavour to get that question, and if possible, I'll try and reach out to that person. Um, okay. The winners um, in the top five, just let us know um, your email address and, and we'll come back to you with that. But I think it leaves me really just to say, Nigel, thank you again for your time and your knowledge. Um, sorry, Rob, there was one just quick question that popped oh, okay. up. I was looking at, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Somebody was asking about Hello. specific types of coaching. So what I would say is that coaching is a very generic and trans transferable skill, very much like project management. I I often argue that a project management in the construction industry can be a project manager in the software industry, can be a project manager in, in the manufacturing and mechanical and electrical engineering industries. It's the same set of disciplines and practices. And it's exactly the same for coaches. But what you'll find in coaching is that coaches will have very, very specific niches. So my particular niche is around the project management arena. It's all around team dynamics, it's all around presentation and speaking, it's all about process. So that's what I do. So for example, I'm not a health and relationship coach, I'm not a confidence coach per se, I'm not um, you know, a mother and child coach, those type of things. People have their own particular niches. But what you will find is that when a client connects with a coach, it's then open season because they might come in for a specific reason to say, I wanna be a better virtual presenter but then the range of subjects that's spoken about within that coaching, confidential coaching conversation could be on a range of anything across life, personal or otherwise, it's not necessarily about work. So the, 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 there's as many, there's many uh, different types of coaches as there are different types of industries or interests or book titles in the world, and you'll find a coach for every single one of them. But fundamentally, they will all start off from very similar principles about what coaching is all about, and they will embody the things I covered tonight, you know, about questioning, listening, and, and providing challenge. And sorry, Rob, I rudely interrupted you as you were doing oh, no. close. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you, you did very well to catch the question as it popped up, and and, and that's the important bit, isn't it? Um, you know, people have kindly submitted their question, and you've, you've kindly taken the time to share knowledge. So um, I'm very grateful for that. So. On that note, Nigel, um, I'd just like to again say thank you on behalf of the APM and thank you on behalf of everyone that's joined us tonight. So thank you. No, you're welcome. And I will get the uh, slide deck across to you later this evening and I'll get the book list and any resources I think are relevant to uh, across to you tomorrow. That's good, okay. man. Thank Excellent. you. Well, thank and, you, everyone. And, and, I'd, and I'd also like to echo Nigel's points there and just say thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Uh, most importantly, keep well, um, and we hope to see you at future APM webinars in the near future. Um, all it leaves me to say is have a great evening, and we'll see you very soon. Bye for right. now. Cheers. Bye, everyone. Thank you.